Good day. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We seem to have quite a lot of interest in this. This seems to be quite a, um, a pertinent and relevant discussion that we're going to have um, because it's really all centred around smoke uh, extract fans, which are fire safety um, um, devices. Um, and obviously it's all about providing that extra level of safety to our um, end users. So what we're going to do is explore a little bit um, about this new, uh, actually not new now, but the, there was a revision to the main fire safety standard that we build uh, the fan product to, uh, which is EN 12101 part three. Um, and so we're going to talk about that, but more in particular, the, the real practical implications of that, because obviously um, many of you on the call today uh, could well be involved in trying to work out the best way to provide a smoke extract system. Um, so we're going to get into that in a little bit of detail as we go. So let's uh, dive in. So what we're actually going to be looking at is just introducing ourselves, but also um, talking a little bit about the Danfoss product and, and why we've you know gone into sort of partnership with them. So there's some real practical reasons for that. Um, then we're going to be talking a little bit about the package. What is it? Um, you know, what's what? Why it's parts? A um, little bit about the context um, and the options. Um, a little bit about the um, variable speed drive uh, fire mode. Uh, a lot of people who offer. Um, variable speed or uh, variable frequency drives uh, to control all sorts of equipment, bands and pumps and that sort of thing. They they have a fire mode um, because obviously it is accepted that in a fire scenario you'll need your devices to do something different. So what does it mean um, for, for the package really? Um, then there is a little bit about the product range scope. Um, we have a lot of products. Um, if you do the maths um, on all of the possible combinations of all the parts that we manufacture in the, the UK, um, there are about 10 million different combinations, probably more than that actually now, uh, but Regularly, we are building maybe three to four hundred thousand combinations of parts and products. Um, so, so obviously, um, we couldn't cover uh, in terms of certification every product for every application. But we'll tell you exactly what we have covered. Uh, the core product ranges are covered. Um, then there's a little bit about uh, our testing experiences. Um, and the certification, you know, what that's all about. Um, so we can kind of point you, you know, signpost you into uh, various directions of what you need to kind of check when you are looking at a product. You know, obviously, we'd love you to only be looking at our products, um, but we accept that you, know, you might need to be looking at an alternative. But if you are, what do you need to check really is what we're going to be kind of looking at. OK, so let's get into the introduction bit. Um, now, this is sort of indicative of of uh, us as a group. Um, and just just introduces us um, and, and, and really kind of what we're trying to achieve here is that we have uh, quite a respectable uh, turnover. Um, but that's not necessarily the point I want to make here. The point here is that we are actually you know, um, in 65 different countries worldwide um, and we are covering that with um, uh, 3,600 3, employees in, in 16 manufacturing sites. Um, but we have um, around the globe, we have 170 dedicated R&D experts um, in nine centers of excellence. So the point is that 
yeah, we've got a lot of coverage across the world so that if anyone needs help in um, a local market with uh, this particular product offering, we have coverage globally. But the other point to make is that because we're using Danfoss drives as part of this package, Danfoss drives um, are um, a much bigger group, in fact, because they're into all sorts of um, segments of different markets. Um, and they are um, you know, a global organization with lots of experts and lots of R&D sites, 12 um, in this particular case. And again, nine centers of excellence. Um, but from that point of view, because they have uh, support for their drives, in um, various locations around the globe. If there is a, a need for support um, in a local market, somewhere in Europe or further afield, um, they can also help because we've been, you know, obviously working with them in partnership on this particular um, uh, package solution. Uh, and that's the point. Whenever you've got a, a, a variable speed drive and a fan involved, when you're integrating it into a system, you know, BMS connectivity questions come up, uh, system design questions come up, uh, installation and setup questions come up. Both ourselves and Danfoss can help uh, with various aspects of that. So there is local support available and that's that's really the message for these two slides. So um, looking uh, a little bit further, um, if we go into the, well, what is the package all about? Um, so we explore that a little bit. What we're really talking about when we're talking about uh, this, this package solution is we're talking about the fan, which obviously is an impeller and motor, uh, essentially. Uh, the motor in particular needs to be of a particular spec. So it's um, designed for high temperature use. Um, and when it's incorporated into our product, it is certified with the product. Um, I have to make the point here, you cannot actually certify a motor uh, to the fan HT uh, standard uh, in its own right, because obviously it's a fan test standard. But the motor uh, specification is very specific. And of course, we, we test it um, both internally in our own lab and on a third party test program uh, to get the certification. The same is really true of the inverter uh, or frequency converter. All variable speed drives um, you know, have similar functionality, but they're built to different standards and have different functions. Um, so you can't say that they're all the same, but they are conceptually doing the same thing. Um, but what we are doing, obviously, when we're testing this whole package um, in a fire test scenario, uh, we're trying to make sure that uh, the whole package, including the, the inverter, uh, is going to be robust and um, going to deliver what we say it's going to. Um, but again, you can't test and certify uh, an inverter in its own right. So any manufacturer of inverter that says we have certification to EN 12101 part three is being a bit misleading because um, they've probably got that, but by virtue of a test with a fan manufacturer. OK, so, so that's what we're talking about. So our kind of proposition is normally centered around an actual flow fan, which is a dual use product. So it's designed for uh, use um, in a um, normal day-to-day -day ventilation mode. Uh, and then you get um, yeah, the high temperature um, kind of duty um, or capability um, as, a, as a standby option for that case where there's a fire. Um, there are other uh, solutions where the fan is not dual mode, it's dedicated. So it only really um, is used during a fire, but we'll explore a little bit of the pros and cons um, 
around that because that isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, so, so we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, we've we've tested this combination of the fan with the motor and the uh, VSD um, in uh, a lab um, in the UK in the Bizra lab. Um, and BSI then uh, reviewed all those results and issued the certificate. Uh, we've tested um, the 300 degrees C um, and 400 degrees C fire resistance categories uh, because they are now far more prevalent than the 200 degrees C um, design criteria, which is pretty much um, died out now. People are designing for the hotter temperatures, which is understandable. Um, and then the important thing to kind of grasp is that we're using very uh, tried and tested um, components in a solution. Uh, they've all been around in the marketplace for a long time, so have a good track record of reliability. Um, but we still obviously had to go through all of the tests to make sure that they were um, performing as, as designed. Um, Obviously, if you've got a complicated building where you could have lots of different fire scenarios, then having a VSD as part of the solution can give uh, a degree of flexibility in terms of you know, what performance you need from the fan. Um, and many inverters, uh, including the Danfoss inverter, have got a way of defining several different set points that then are engaged you know whatever the, the set point is that's selected that will be engaged during the emergency mode and locked in uh, as as the design point um, inverters also give um, the ability to link uh, the fan um, to the bms uh, so that you can obviously do uh, a bit more fine tuning, especially during the normal ventilation mode. You know, it can be really brought into a ventilation on demand type of logic um, if it's all linked into the BMS. So, so you know, it's it's a useful thing to do. And obviously, uh, increasingly, we are trying to get more uh, performance for less energy usage. Um, you know, this is going to be a theme that is only strengthened over time. Um, and then uh, the thing to say about the fire mode um, type of um, concept is that what the fire mode is trying to do is to um, ensure that the fan VSD package is operating for uh, two hours, um, although uh, the the UK standard F300 is actually one hour duration, uh, but uh, all of our fans are actually tested for in excess of, of two hours. Uh, so, you know, for the UK standard, we actually overperform significantly. Um, so, so that's what fire mode does. It, it's constantly monitoring the motor uh, health during uh, during that period of increased uh, thermal stress and managing it to make sure that it just keeps going. Uh, and we've seen this in our tests uh, in the lab. And then finally, we can just say just a bit, you know, a, a statement of fact, really, um, that when we launched this product and it's been around in the market now for a few years, you know, since 2018 now, um, at that time, we were the first to launch this fully um, certified package. A few of our competitors have now caught up a little bit, uh, although obviously we've been doing this a lot longer than most of them. So just a sort of statement there that we were head of the pack uh, in this particular case. And it is a partnership between Woods, uh, Woods Air Movement, which is you know our sort of trading name for Flat Group. Um, or Flatwoods and Danfoss work together to give this solution, um, you know, life into the market. So that's the kind of package. Now, I just want to just remind people a little bit about 
um, the fan element and that the design uh, steps that we go through um, and you know just what we do to achieve a very robust um, smoke extract solution so what we actually do is that we um, look very closely at the rotating element the impeller um, that's the bit that's seeing the stresses um, under load uh, and the material choice is really, really important. Um, depending on what the temperature category is, we will actually um, change the materials to suit. Uh, the component fit, um, all those tolerances when we're manufacturing, very closely controlled to make sure that uh, everything fits correctly, because uh, obviously these impeller assemblies are going to be heated up. Um, to 400 degrees C in some cases. Um, and the tip gap between the uh, casing and the, uh, at the end of the impeller blade uh, is, is very, very important in that respect. Um, which is the next point there. Um, and that obviously that's because you get uh, an expansion of the material with, with the increase in temperature. Um, before we even cast any metal blades or build any casings we design the product virtually uh, and from a um, an structural integrity point of view we're looking at this with finite element analysis um, which is just a you know a tool to build it in a virtual way um, uh, so, so that's the retoting element um, but also casings as well we can have a look to see uh, under loads, how casings will react. Um, and so we can test all the major elements in that way before we even build a physical fan. Uh, the motor specifications, as I said before, they are really, really critical. Uh, and we spend a lot of time with our motor suppliers, working with them to make sure that, in particular, the bearings, which are obviously the critical part of the, the motor, uh, they're designed in a robust way. The fit of the bearing, usually C3, um, is, is something that we need to be um, ensuring. Uh, the grease, though, is absolutely critical. Um, it has to be um, coping with a wide range of conditions, which is quite difficult because, you know, it's a dual mode fan. It's going to be 20 to 40 degrees C under normal conditions, let's say. Uh, ambient uh, gets a little bit hotter inside the bearings, obviously. Um, but you know, under uh, fire uh, or smoke extract conditions, you're going to see 300 or 400 degrees C air or gas coming over the uh, motor. Uh, so all of that plus the built-in cooling system has to be absolutely right. And obviously we test all that during many, many uh, qualification tests that we do internally and externally in third party uh, test labs. Um, so yeah, which is what I basically just said there, we test internally, we test externally. And it is a requirement of the certification that we test externally. We get a third party to do the tests. We get a third party to issue the certificates um, so that there is you know, obviously no hint that um, there is any bias there these third parties have got a reputation to uphold. So if they say it passes, then they've made sure that it meets all the criteria. So, okay, that's all I really wanna say about the, the package. Now we're gonna be looking a little bit about the context of the standard. I'll try and make this as uh, punchy as I can because standards aren't the most interesting documents, perhaps. Um, and then we'll just explore a little bit about the options. OK, so um, this standard changed um, in April 2017 uh, and then it had a, a bit of a year, uh, a period of time, the year 18 months of, of kind of um, transition before it became something that was mandatory. Um, so, so the changes in this standard really did make it a game changer because before it basically said, yep, you can uh, either plug your fan into the mains, 
direct online. Uh, or you can have an inverter. But the inverter um, must be um, switched out of, um, of circuit uh, when there's a fire. So the, the game changer in this new standard was uh, basically to allow some third party testing uh, of a fan and VSD package. Uh, and having done that testing, um, the standard then basically said, well, as long as you can demonstrate as a manufacturer that your um, motor um, ambient temperature or temperature rise, or to the point, because the, the performance of the motor is influenced by the ambient temperature and the temperature rise above that. Um, if you can keep the temperature rise of the motor within limits that you'd normally see uh, at normal ambient temperature, but keep that as limits, um, uh, keep to those limits when you're operating at a, a high temperature. Uh, you do the test and ensure that that is the case uh, and the fan physically does not fail, um, the inverter or anything else for that matter, then you only have to do a minimal 5% motor D rate. When by D rate, we, what we're really saying is, is that there is at least a margin of 5% of power uh, in hand between the fan um, power requirement that's required to actually physically turn the impeller around uh, and the motor output power. Okay, and if we do all that testing and we have that minimum power in hand, um, then we then the standard says there's no need to fit a thing called a voltage waveform filter, which I'll go into in a bit more detail um, uh, a little later. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little later. So that was the one option that was or a new option that was added, um, and then there was still the option to bypass the VSD. Uh, if you know there's a fire, it switches over to 100% of speed, uh, so 50 hertz if it's you know, 50 hertz electrical supply, but you know, 60 hertz um, could be the full speed um, uh, frequency. Um, so then you've got um, no interaction with the VSD at all during a fire, um, and that could still be appropriate in some uh, applications. Uh, so that's very much part of the standard as, as an option. Okay. And then the third option uh, is that although you've got this you know, fully tested certified range as an option, which is a new thing, um, if you're not doing those tests, um, and some manufacturers chose not to do those tests initially and still haven't done those tests, uh, what that actually means is that the standard then says you've got to have a bigger amount of power in hand in your motor um, and you've got to fit a voltage waveform filter between uh, the VSD and the fan motor. OK, um, now obviously we'll dig into the implications of that a little bit more, but you can probably immediately see that that's adding some extra complication and extra cost uh, and it has uh, an implication for the design so we'll, we'll explore that a little bit more in detail okay so those are the three options that the new standard that came out um, in 2017 said there were possible uh, in the context of using a high temperature smoke extract fan uh, with inverter okay so let's have a look at the first option in a bit more detail um, so we've carried out this um, test um, on a range of fans, motors uh, and inverters. Um, and as I said before, it, you, you haven't done physical tests, so you now are very confident because you've tested the actual hardware um, to qualify a range. Uh, that it will do what you think it's going to do. And so there's a minimal D rate on the motor. Um, and then, you know, it has to be said that this is all assuming that uh, the fan then is used in a actual real life 
uh, scenario um, with those same components. So downforce inverters. Um, and there are two um, parts of the range that they, they, that they offer inverters for. We call them, or they call them the FC101 and the FC102 drives. Um, basically, it's a FC101 is a micro drive, which is a, a reduced uh, function uh, drive that's designed very specifically for the HVAC market. Um, but it does many of the things that the more capable FC102 drive does. But the, the FC102 drive has got uh, expansion capabilities. So, you know, it's a bigger drive, so you can put in different communication cards. Um, so, you know, uh, if you've got a particular uh, BMS protocol, uh, Modbus or BACnet or, or whatever, um, those um, protocol specific comms cards can be added to the 102 drive. They can't be added to the 101 because it's it's not possible to upgrade that. Um, FC102 also has the capability to uh, change the RFI filter uh, standard, whereas the 101 you get what you get. So it's it's possible, you know, to use either one of those, whichever one is appropriate. But but the core components for the control um, modules inside each of those are common, so we we're able to do tests uh, which confirm that both those drives were capable. Um, and that's you know that's written into our documentation. Um, so looking at the fan. Uh, so here is the typical fan with a high temperature motor, uh, nicely in red there. Um, and obviously, this is the sort of scenario that you see. Um, and under that sort of um, schema, if you have a fire, um, then uh, because it's a fully certified um, type of solution, uh, we're very confident that it will you know, do as we say it will do. And this is our recommended solution. If you if you then kind of put that into some context, um, obviously in the past uh, we had a VSD that switched out um, uh, off circuit, um, and this is uh, possibly a problem. Depends on the system. Um, and as I was saying before um, earlier in the presentation, if you have a, a situation where um, you, you need a particular um, solution in terms of the smoke extraction rate, or you need to be able to have different smoke extra extraction rates depending on what part of the building's on fire, let's say, um, then you can do that with a VSD more easily than you can do it with um, a more complex system with dampers and sorts of, um, you know, uh, ways of varying the performance also if you throttle a fan uh, down in performance with dampers it's a very wasteful um, type of solution you know, it uses quite a lot of energy um, so it's not not a great solution whereas vsd is uh, a better solution um to say next point is really explaining what i've just said a little bit more okay so let's go to the next uh, option, the bypassing option. And this is something, as I said, it's been in the standard for a long time and it's still there and it's still valid for some cases. Um, so, you know, you design two duty points, basically normal day to day and smoke extract, and you just um, switch from one to the other by having the inverter either in or out of circuit. Yeah, you know, it's simple. Um, except it's not just like a light switch that you're putting in there it's it's the changeover switch is is quite a uh, substantial piece of equipment and you know, obviously you've got this you know, scenario fire is happening and it switches over and then the, the, the vsd is out of circuit now that all sounds very straightforward um and in concept it is but if you've got a very large fan um, with a heavy impeller which has got a high moment of inertia um, if you are changing 
from one speed to another um, in, in response to a fire alarm triggering the uh, fire mode. Um, then when you're switching over, you can't switch over instantly. You have to have a bit of logic in the system that says, OK, um, my fan is running at, I don't know, normal day to day. It might be running at 30 hertz. I don't know. Let's say that's what it's running at. Um, but you want to then run it at 50 hertz, um, i.e. full speed. Uh, when it's um, in an emergency, because you can't vary the speed um, if you haven't got an inverter in in the circuit. But you can't just switch the switch when the fan's running at 30 uh, hertz. You have to switch the switch, and then there's a delay in the supply actually being engaged from the mains, because then you've got to put some logic in that runs the, the fan speed up to 50 hertz. Once it's matched to 50 hertz, you switch out the inverter and you switch it on to DOL, and, and you know then then the fan can um, operate. If you don't do that, what you're trying to do is instantly change the, the frequency from 30 to 50, and you do risk damaging the motor. Um, and the last thing you want to do just before uh, a fire extract uh, duty uh, is to damage the motor because the motor is a critical component. So just a word of caution, uh, change over switches have their own uh, uh, associated uh, risks and problems. Um, also, you know, um, though it is, uh, as I say, this robust solution, it, it must the fan then must run at full speed, uh, whatever the synchronous speed is, um, which might just sound a simple thing uh, to say. But you know, obviously, you have to make sure that if the fan is doing that and you're then producing more pressure with the fan, that you're not causing some component damage in the system by overpressurizing parts of that system. But, you know, normally that's part of the design brief um, uncovered. But if you overpressurize a stairwell pressurization system, then that can be really serious because if you overpressurize escape doors, then you might not be able to, as an occupant, to actually escape the building. Um, and I've had a personal experience in a mock up of a system um, where we took the differential pressure across a door from 50 pascals to 200 pascals. And at 200 pascals, it's pretty impossible to open that door more than you know, maybe 50 or 60 uh, um, uh, millimeters before it slams shut again. Um, so that's a consideration uh, for sure. Um, and it also limits the choices severely uh, in terms of what your extraction rates are. Now, if you then look at the third option, um, which is where we ha you know, can't do tests, uh, let's say, but you then want to offer a, um, a VST to control the fan. Um, then obviously what you can do is to um, go down this third route, which is to derate the motor or oversize the motor by 20%. Uh, and then it is mandatory, uh, no option to this, uh, the installer must install some uh, sort of voltage waveform filter um, between uh, the electrical supply and um, or the motor and the um, the VSD actually. So so what we're then doing there is adding some extra protection in. Okay, so we'll explore what that is all about in a second. But the first thing to sort of say, here's your fan uh, under normal circumstances. Um, you know, and then you have to add this voltage waveform filter. And the first thing to kind of take on board looking at this image is I have not exaggerated the size of the voltage waveform filter in this image. It is almost as big as VSD. And in some cases, it might even be bigger. Um, certainly, it is as expensive or 
can be more expensive than the VST. Um, it's because there is a very chunky uh, heat sink uh, and bit of equipment inside this box. And even a, a comparatively small um, voltage waveform filter, so rated for 2.2 kilowatts or something like that, can weigh in excess of 20 kilos. So it's a substantial piece of equipment, which is expensive. Um, and you've also you know, got to do something in terms of how it's installed. So get onto that in a little bit. Um, the other thing to say is that the motor size then increases. Now I've just, you know, in a very cartoonish way shown you that growing. But what that actually means in real life is that you'll end up with a situation where that motor doesn't fit in that fan anymore. Uh, so you might have to have a bigger fan. Um, so, you know, that that is obviously um, a bit of a problem. So let's, let's dig in to a few more of the, the problems, OK, uh, associated with that. Um, so, you know, the motor must increase in size. So not only physically have you got a problem, but obviously that will increase the cost of the uh, motor and then obviously the fan. Um, and you've got to have this voltage uh, waveform filter, as I said. Um, now, I can't emphasize as much they are, that, that, that they are very expensive. Um, so it, it is a commercial situation that is uh, not a positive one. Um, and what we are saying to people is that you know, obviously you've got to put control equipment such as a VSD or starters or anything like that. And in this case, also the voltage waveform filters, they have to be in a remotely uh, mounted control panel in some fire protected enclosure somewhere in the building. Um, and then, you know, obviously because you've got this extra piece of equipment, the filter, you need uh, um, to have uh, an increased size of panel. Um, so you've got the drive motor increases, the fan costs increases. Uh, also, uh, because of the larger motor, you'll get higher amp ratings. So you've got higher amp ratings for wiring. So you need you know, to upgrade your wiring uh, and anything else. So the inverter itself would need to be you know, increased in size because of the amp rating. So everything um, scales up and, uh, you know, has, has sort of practical installation and, and cost implications. Okay. So that sort of goes through the um, three options in the standard uh, that you can go for. So it's just worth having a quick run through uh, what the um, fire mode is all about and I, and I have to say that quite a lot of uh, the VSD manufacturers that uh, have offerings on the market have very similar fire modes for exactly the same reason so yeah this this bit is not really necessarily specific to Danfoss uh, or the woods um, package okay but uh, yeah, let's, let's just explain a little bit about this so the first thing to say is, well, wh why do we have a fire mode? You know, what, what's the point of it? Well, uh, smoke is the main problem in any fire. Um, so, you know, if you can't see where to go, you can't necessarily find your way out of the building. Um, and it, it also stops or, or hinders um, the firefighting effort. So, you know, the fire brigade has got a problem getting into the building. Um, but the main thing really is that smoke is a killer and it will get you before the fire does. Uh, and that's a bit of a brutal thing to say, but you know, that is um, the truth of the matter. So extracting smoke in an effective way to ensure that people have got a real chance of getting out of that building um, is, is a key thing to do. Uh, and that's something that we are very passionate about providing. Um, whenever we're talking about fire protection as a concept applied to a building, um, it's always really 
um, something that you need to apply in terms of thinking about it as a system. You're not just talking about a fan in isolation. Uh, the fire protection system is a number of components. Um, and, and what we're really um, trying to get across here is that you know you can make the best uh, choice of uh, smoke extract fan um, and then pair it with uh, a, an inappropriate or less effective uh, associated piece of equipment. You know, it can be as simple as choosing the wrong spec for the wiring between um, the uh, control uh, elements that are you know, in a fire protected um, area. Uh, between that and the fan, if you pick you know, standard wiring, then that wiring burns through uh, and you know, the fan doesn't work. So it's got to be uh, um, high temperature rated, uh, fire rated uh, wiring. So even the simplest thing, if you make the wrong choice, can, can be a showstopper. Um, so it needs to be a system approach concept. Um, I've already mentioned this sort of idea of having a dedicated fan versus a non-dedicated fan. And when I say non-dedicated, I mean dual mode. So you know, it's going to be used normal ventilation day to day and then uh, have the ability to go one step further in, a, in an emergency to provide smoke extract. So there's there's two two options there. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit further on. And then obviously you could draw a conclusion which is uh, along these lines, which is you know, the reliability of any system decreases as you increase the number of components. Um, and yeah, to a degree, I, I would understand and agree with that. So you know, here we are adding an inverter and you, know, you could be asking the question, well, yeah, that's going to increase the complexity a bit and therefore reduce the reliability. What I want to explain in response to that is that our experience during testing has not uh, supported that. In fact, quite the reverse, but, but we'll get onto that in a second. And then um, the one thing that the fire mode does within the software of the um, variable speed drive is to create uh, a priority set of functions um, that overrides everything else uh, that has the one um, purpose of just keeping that drive uh, uh, outputting uh, a, a preset uh, level of electrical supply at a particular frequency to keep the motor turning to keep the fan operating and that's that's what fire mode is conceptually all about okay so fire mode in particular it basically switches off all of the um safety devices inside now what by safety devices i'm specifically thinking about a uh, overheat protection device um, overheat protection can be supplied in many different ways, but if you've got uh, overheat protection um, built into uh, an inverter, as most cases, that's that's how it works. Current sensing, um, uh, which which provides that protection. The last thing you want to do in a smoke extraction uh, scenario is to detect that the uh, the temperature in the motor is rising and then think that that's due to an over uh, load um, and that you then switch the supply off. Um, under normal uh, uh, operating conditions, when there isn't a fire, that's fine. You're protecting the equipment and, you know, OK, it might be an inconvenience, but uh, somebody from maintenance can then check it out and, and work out what the problem is. But during a fire, you just want it to do it. Just get on with it uh, and extract the smoke. Um, so it overrides that particular safety uh, device, but it does do some monitoring of what um, it, it's actually, uh, how it's interacting with the motor. And, and it will, on occasions, if that temperature gets too high, it will trip, but it will automatically reset and it will just 
keep monitoring that and and uh, keep that motor going. Um, so basically, it just keeps keeps on operating and and just keeps going um, for that two hour period or longer. Um, you can actually enable fire mode uh, automatically um, or or it can be via a sort of digital input so it, it can be linked to you know a fire uh, alarm uh, system so you know if someone hits the alarm a digital system is sent uh, and yeah that the the drive has fire mode engaged um, mentioned this before can't emphasize it enough fire rated cables absolute must um, and then you know as i said all these non-critical faults and warnings will just be inactivated uh, and ignored. Okay. So if we then put that to one side, we've kind of looked at fire mode. Uh, what about applications, uh, typical applications? Well, we've already mentioned stairwell pressurization. Um, so, so obviously that's something that uh, this type of uh, equipment is used for uh, lift shaft pressurization, similar type of thing. Smoke extract fans for for um, yeah, multi-zone buildings, um, and then in car parks because many buildings have underground car parks or car parks uh, are separate but you know, associated with the building. Um, you will want to have a slightly different logic to that particular schema. Um, car parks in particular, you know, obviously in the future this will change, but right now where we've still got cars with uh, um, you know, run on fossil fuels, you've got a need for pollution control. Um, however, in the future where you've got more uh, electric vehicles or maybe even hydrogen vehicles, you'll have a different type of fire risk to to cope with so you know obviously there will be changes that are, will happen over time but right now pollution control is your day-to-day -day running and smoke extract is your you know, emergency duty and fans um, in car parks are designed to do that and you can do that quite readily with um, uh, inverters although currently a lot of car park designs are based on two-speed motors but that's another story and then, of course, um, you've got a similar thrust based fan solution to the ones that you use in car parks. They're generally ductless. Uh, you've got a similar solution, but a larger fan that's used in tunnels, for tunnel ventilation. And again, there's pollution control and smoke extract um, in the event of a fire. So what are the advantages of doing that with a, with a VSD? Well, you can very precisely control uh, the duty that you are achieving. Um, it can be adaptive, especially in pollution control based on NOx or CO sensors, let's say, you know, it picks up that pollution. Um, and, and you've got this flexibility to adapt the fan performance as the system you know, evolves. You, know, you might be building um, a project in phases, so you might need to uh, change fan performance over the various phases of the project and then of course energy saving keeps coming to the top of the agenda um, because it, it's really uh, critical now especially with the escalating costs so energy saving under normal uh, everyday um, kind of conditions lends itself very very clearly to inverter okay so um, having talked about um, all of the package and the context and fire mode, we really need to get to talk about, well, OK, um, woods or flatwoods have got a range of fans, but, but what range of fans are in the scope of this uh, certification? And we've also got a fan selection tool, uh, software, uh, where you know um, knowing how to select this package appropriately is an important thing to know. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. 
So the first thing to say is that um, we're talking specifically uh, anything that is high temperature um, with a couple of exceptions, but we'll get to that in a second. But it's most impeller geometries that we're talking about uh, in our JM, uh, JMV range. But we've also covered the two stage JM2 uh, product and truly symmetrical um, or truly reversible uh, products. So the JMTS, um, so that's the thrust based one for tunnels. And the JMTSP, the P for pressure developing, uh, that's for the duct mounted um, type of uh, application. Typically, JMTSP fans would be used in car park. Uh, smoke extract uh, applications um, along with jet fans um, as a total solution. And then the jet fans that I've just mentioned, they are the JT and the JTV impeller variants. Uh, in both cases, JMV and the JTV, the V is the uh, high efficiency solution uh, that uh, has got um, an improved impeller and fixed um, uh, component geometry which can give you know um, in in many cases uh, a 15 point efficiency point improvement so you know it's it's worth looking at those you could even use less fans for your system because you know, it gives more performance as well in terms of volume and pressure okay um, we have a range of motors qualified for use within these fans from a 71 to a 280 frame. Um, and that could be either a foot mounted, pad mounted or flange mounted design. So that means that we can use it in a variety of different fan uh, designs. Um, basically, it just means we can cover the range of fan impellers that we've just uh, mentioned at the top. And, um, and then what we then need to look at is well, what is the maximum size of uh, motor BST? And in this case, um, it's a, we do have a one combination that is uh, allowing us to go up to uh, 104 kilowatts, but the general rule for most parts of the range is around 90 kilowatts. Um, so no, larger motors are not currently uh, certified. Um, and then uh, I need to say a little bit about the um, electrical supply. Um, this is relating to the electrical supply to the motor rather than the electrical supply to the, um, the drive. But you know, in most cases, you can call that the same. But the point is, it's not just 50 hertz, it's 60 hertz. Um, uh, up to 60 hertz. In fact, you will see if you look at the design tool, the, the fan selector, that uh, uh, for some combinations of fan and inverter, it's possible to run uh, the fan at above 60 hertz. Uh, it, it all really all depends on the maximum speed of the impeller um, uh, for which it's designed, which is the next point there. So. Um, So then we need to just say a little bit about the um, HT categories for which it is designed. Um, it's 300 degrees C for an hour, which is uh, F300, which is the category that's used in the UK uh, for most designs. 300 for two hours, which is becoming more prevalent and is used you know, further afield. Um, Middle and Far East, it's it's quite popular in those areas, and 400 degrees C for two hours, or F400, um, that's used in quite a lot of places in Europe now. So you know, that it's uh, they are the most common categories. Around 95, 96 percent of the HG uh, inquiries that we see are covered by those uh, three categories. Um, which is why we didn't actually do um, anything to focus um, on the 200 degrees C specification. So, you know, we'd obviously always um, advise that that is uh, up, up spec to 300 for two or 300 for one, in fact. 
but all motors are actually designed for two hours um, duration so whether you do that for one or two hours uh, they are still capable for two hours and the approved VSD in this range is the Danfoss range uh, of uh, FC 101 or FC 102 okay so having said that then um, the uh, the situation is that you're probably asking the question to yourself um, can we use some other inverter other than a Danfoss well in theory it's possible but then you know because the standard does allow for that possibility uh, but then in practice what it means is is that you have to then try and assess um, and the risk is then more for the designer or the installer um, to assess does this alternative um, drive uh, perform uh, at least as well or better than a Danfoss drive from these ranges that I've mentioned um, and and that can be quite difficult to determine so obviously the safest possibility is to use you know, the, the Danfoss drive as part of the package but you know to say in theory it's possible to use another um, drive from another manufacturer so let's just dig a little bit more into um, the exclusions because there are a few not many um, so the exclusions include bifurcated fans um, so these are fans where the motor is out of airstream um, and so to be honest those fans are normally used for um, that sort of kitchen extract or something like that so you wouldn't normally necessarily want to uh, kind of uh, use an inverter maybe um, but in that case they're not high temperature smoke extract fans anyway and so you know it's, it's not relevant to the HT part car park jet fans uh, in our range come in two different designs there is the cylindrical design that uses uh, an actual flow fan impeller uh, which is included in the scope of the certification or you've got um, the induction type fans which have got a centrifugal impeller inside these are not included in the certification um, so if you want to have those in a system a car park uh, smoke extract or uh, smoke management system um, that part couldn't be controlled with an inverter but then that those types of fans and are not normally in, uh, inverter controlled anyway um, we can't use motors that are smaller than the, the frame sizes that we've tested or larger than the frame sizes that we've tested which means that we can't use motors uh, that are larger than this sort of 90 or 104 kilowatts um, without taking a different um, uh, way of looking at the standard because as I said right at the very beginning there are three ways of satisfying the standard uh, and one of those ways is if you've got a motor that's larger than 104 kilowatts um, is to actually fit a voltage waveform filter and you know, uh, increase the rating of the motor um, and so that's still possible or you know switch the inverter out um, uh, when there is an emergency that's another option um, we don't have any single phase motors included within the certification it's highly unusual to have a single phase high temperature extract fan um, and in fact technically that's a bit uh, difficult to achieve uh, it's possible but it's it's not not very practical um, the main problem is that single phase fans tend to have a capacitor uh, that capacitor is normally attached to the motor motors in the airstream capacitors are going to be uh, failing um, very very quickly uh, when you get um, temperatures above normal ambient so single phase is not part of that uh, certification um, and I say the 200 degrees C for two hours is not included, but similarly, um, 
600 degrees C uh, for an hour or two hours, that's also excluded. Um, we haven't done tests for that, but that's again a very small part of our uh, overall um, inquiry um, kind of range. And there, there is actually a Danfoss um, drive called an FC51, which is used in another part of our product range to satisfy speed control elements uh, of a fan that's got a three phase motor inside, but the site electrical supply may well have a single phase supply only. Um, so this particular inverter will do that. But again, you know, yeah, that particular product, which is aimed at um, a kind of a uh, the uh, hospitality type of segment of the market, isn't and specifically food um, preparation outlets uh, is not really um, normally having a smoke extract fan with an inverter attached to it. Um, it's a much smaller building, so you know the, the smoke control system is very, very simple. Open the door, um, basically, and run away. Um, so, so those are the exclusions for the range. Which, you know, it's not not too many in that list. Um, and then, what uh, I also need to say: what other things are uh, not included? So they're not exclusions, but they're they're out of scope options okay um, so if you've got an option or a solution a fan with an inverter that is outside the scope so you've got a larger motor um, uh, or something like that um, then you have to offer on the basis that the the VST is bypassed during um, a fire event really um, or you know if you've got to have it um, then, uh, yeah, as a, as a as a a smoke extract, a piece of logic for your system must be inverter controlled, and it's larger than that. Then we can ob obviously do tests, and we can uh, provide costs for the tests uh, necessary to uh, extend our um, certification to cover the the larger fan. But obviously, that needs to be you know, built into the project uh, price. And the delivery time so that will have impact on that but it might be the most practical way to deliver the solution for that particular project so it could be worth doing um, uh, or you, you could just have a voltage waveform filters um, yeah, but then there's an associated um, d rate on the motor to take into consideration um, and then the other considerations is that you know obviously we have to take into consideration that the customer's specification has a requirement to use a VSD during uh, you're in a fire. We, we, we can't just ignore that um, because you then can't easily retrospectively fit a larger motor uh, and it will also be a very costly option. So we really do need to know that type of thing right the way up the front uh, when we're, we're putting the bid together. Uh, and then uh, if VSD is supplied by others, as I mentioned earlier on, no VSD manufacturer can claim that they comply to that standard because it's a fan test standard. Um, so, so we can say that um, the, the Danfoss uh, drive is certified by association with our fan because it's Part of our fan certification, but nobody can say that even Danfoss actually uh, that their fan, their motor um, control device, their inverter, is actually uh, certified to that standard. So just a little bit on um, the fan selection software. Not too much. Uh, don't worry. I'm not going to go through too many detailed steps here. Um, when we're looking at the selector. Um, and there are, uh, you know, um, a few options embedded within it. Um, we can offer on the basis that the VSD will be bypassed. Yeah, that's one of the options. Um, but where there is a need to um, have a VSD uh, for a fire 
um, rated fan or smoke extract fan, um, then yeah, we can we can cope with that with either it's certified because it's less than 90 or 104 kilowatts, or it can have a filter. Uh, you know that can be coped with. But the the most um, relevant thing to do if it's obviously within the certified range is to choose um, a fan and a VSD combination that has been fully tested as part of that certified range. So you can actually flag that up as a preferred option within the software uh, before you start doing your selections uh, and it will make sure that it is part of that certified range. Yeah, so you know it gives you that sort of extra little bit of um, reassurance. So you you will get this sort of dialogue appear that says um, gives you the option show only fans that are certified, and you tick that box, and it will then say, okay, I'll do this double check for you. I'm not quite sure why anyone wouldn't want to tick that box, but you know, it, it is flexible in that. Um, kind of respect but uh, normally we would sort of pre-tick that and then if you're doing lots of selections so it's not just a one-off selection but many fans you, you probably want to tick the remember that um, option the current session because you don't want to keep saying yes every time uh, to that question and then it you know makes it a little bit more uh, straightforward and then when you you get a selection um, it'll actually confirm uh, that it is compliant with on you know, in the documentation that the software produces on the data sheet um, and it will give you all the uh, performance data um, in particular in, in particular it will give you obviously the performance curve uh, but because you're driving it with an inverter it will only give you one curve rather than a family of curves that you normally see, but it also give you uh, minimum and maximum um, running speeds. And in this particular example, the maximum running speed for this particular fan uh, at this particular temperature um, is uh, 53 hertz, um, but many of them are higher than that. It also specifies the minimum uh, running speed as well. Okay. Um, and then we ought to be just saying that before you make this selection, um, you, you've got to actually define a little bit about what the VSD is. Um, so in that particular case, it's you go to a, a tab that says speed control and motor, which is you know, highlighted on the screen in that shot. Uh, you select inverter uh, from the type of control drop down menu and then you can choose um, normally I, I would suggest you select uh, the select fan at catalog speed 50 or 60 hertz or select fan at requested speed um, but you know the, the the middle one of the three options is generally the one that I recommend um, and then we have to say don't change any of the motor options uh, or anything under the motor options on the uh, right hand side here just leave that as the default uh, and then you know you don't have to work out what the extra motor service factors are because that's all done behind the scenes for you um, and a little bit about the variant note uh, so you can have different types of inverter now i mentioned um, that there are two inverter types fc 101 and fc 102 and basically the way they are selected is that if you pick an IP rating that's IP54, you know, that's selected by you know, the, the drop down menus here, that, that will give you an FC101. And if you pick the IP66 version, you'll get the FC102. Um, we're looking at actually adding another couple of options to that in the future. Uh, so that advice may well change. But as it is at the moment, that's, that's what you'll get. Okay, so just a little bit to finish off this piece um, because you know uh, we we just want to share some of the things about our testing experience. Uh, some of you might not have seen the inside of a test lab. 
And if you think it's all shiny equipment and flashing lights and you know impressive looking uh, displays, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to now disappoint you a little bit because they they can they look quite basic. So um, this is kind of um, uh, a kind of set of three images that show you uh, something of the test laboratory at Bizra. Um, what you can see on the right hand side and the left hand side are sections of a piece of ductwork, which is a sort of um, a recirculation loop uh, of ductwork. So it goes around in a um, uh, closed loop. And then in the bottom of this um, closed loop, so it's easier to get to, um, the, uh, the, the test uh, technician will bolt up um, the test fan. And you see an example of one of our fans, a smallest fan there uh, in the middle um, of that shot. Um, what you'll, you'll then see in this uh, image is um, the fan is bolted up in the uh, left hand image and you've got uh, one of the guys at Bizra uh, looking at some test results um, from a, uh, a piece of specialised equipment which is um, uh, you know, trying to uh, obtain or its purpose is to obtain um, voltage data, so peak to peak um, and rise time values um, that that are a, an artifact of the drive, basically. Uh, and on the right hand side, you'll see a sort of a um, zoomed in larger version of a typical kind of uh, result that uh, that you'd see from that piece of equipment. Um, and voltages uh, are the, the spikes in voltage in particular are very critical to all of this because obviously what you're trying to do is to uh, make sure that during the course of this two hour test and it's actually probably longer than two hours because you've got to warm the whole rig up and then you set the test off and you don't always actually shut the test down after yeah, two hours and one second. It's it will uh, tend to sometimes go on a little bit longer. And some of the tests went on for three hours plus. So you know, we just uh, got bored after a while and stopped the test. Or the the, the buddy test house uh, guys did. Uh, we were there in attendance, but not obviously physically allowed to do the test. We were just watching. Um. So so this. Uh, sort of data is obtained you know during the course of the test to just make sure that what you've got is a um, a motor that is not being subjected to um, high voltage spikes because uh, that could be damaging so this this is what uh, is the key piece of data really uh, from the test other than the fact that we uh, also obtain um, data from the test which tells us uh, what the volume uh, flow rate is so we make sure that the fan is still performing uh, within limits after two hours. Now the tests have been around for a very long time. Um, the standard has evolved from uh, before um, the millennium so you know there were versions of it in the 1990s um, but it's been updated several times so we, we understand this test very well but you know you're still getting sort of some interesting um, kind of experiences um, and on the on the left hand side you can see a drive uh, more specifically you can see a circuit board a printed circuit board now obviously you normally shouldn't see that um, the image that's in the middle is a, an image of the side panel that was on the drive before somebody wired it up wrong and it uh, causes uh, uh, the, the side panel to um, come away um, or be ejected and you say it looks a little bit sort of blackened in places. Um, this isn't a fault of the, the, the product per se uh, but it does kind of just um, illustrate that 
the installation process and the wiring up of the connection of the, the, the equipment has to be followed to the letter from the installation guides that are supplied. So, you know, it is a lesson learned for sure. Um, on the right hand side, you can see images of um, motor bearings. You can also see if you look carefully that the, the outer surfaces of the bearing uh, in, that have been exposed there when we took the motor apart uh, look a little blue. They, they exhibit um, overheating. Um, now, after every test, we will take the fan out of the test rig and then um, have a little bit of a look in detail and where necessary, tear it down more to take a look at uh, some of the more critical components just to see you know, what condition they're in. Um, so it's, it's uh, not an unusual thing to do. I just want to see you know, how, how robust that design is. Okay, so now we get to the certificate part. Um, what is the certificate? And okay, so this, this certificate was um, originally issued back in February 2020, um, you know, BC, so before COVID. Um, and then it was recently updated um, uh, in the middle of last year we added some more products to it. Um, we have a um, have to say here that you know, the certificate doesn't make any statement on the first page about the use of uh, variable speed drives. It doesn't mention Danfoss, um, and, and you know it's it, you might be disappointed to learn that that it doesn't actually say that in in sort of very clear language on a on the first page because the first page is the the certificate page that most people use as evidence that they've got cert certification right uh, but you know it's standard for that uh, um, cert certificate not to be going into that sort of level of detail um, it it does though reference a uh, a technical annex file uh, on its subsequent pages um, and it's this technical annex file uh, together with those subsequent pages which will refer to um, inverters being part of a tested um, product offering that that's the bit that needs to be kind of pro you know, provided uh, as proof uh, and obviously we've got that um, which we can offer to people if they ask uh, us for additional proof but we've also got declarations of performance those those documents which are legal documents as well which we can provide um, and so those need to be uh, requested if you want uh, that proof uh, but that's that's no problem for us you know we have all that uh, documentation around us um, and um, as I say, the, the wording will be in this technical annex file that is fans driven by a CWM frequency converter at ambient and at high temperature, uh, A.1.N. Um, and that just refers to you know, a particular part of the standard. And you will then see you know, a certificate um, very like the one that's being shown on the right hand side. So you know, an image of our certificate. But when you get into the detail pages, you know, there's the, there's the technical annex is mentioned, as I say, and the technical annex file is this file that you see on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and then the left hand side of the screen, it's a typical uh, example page of, of the certification pack. Um, the certificate, I have to point out, is not just one page, it's 26 pages at the moment. Uh, and rising because um, it covers lots of uh, uh, product variants. But the important thing is down the bottom of the page, it will say BISRA reports, refer to those report references. That's an internal reference for us. Um, and then it will say inverters, refer to the technical annex file. And you know, that, that is a key part. That's not mentioned on you know, our competitors' uh, certification. It's indicative that they don't have this certification. Um, and then 
the um, technical annex file and there's a bit of a zoomed in section there actually you know that's something that we can provide as a bit of technical help as well um, you know it's practical um, in in the context of uh, installation uh, so you've got you know information like uh, maximum cable sizes uh, like um, minimum cable lengths um, and ramp up times for setup of the inverter and switching frequencies, all of which can influence um, the, um, the the robustness of of the solution. Uh, and also, you've got all your amp ratings there. Um, so you know, you've, it's, there's some very practical advice there in that document. Um, and then I mentioned the declaration of performance, the DOP. Um, which uh, we also have, but you know, every manufacturer will have this because it's a legal requirement. And so within the document, which you see on the right hand side, you've got a section, section nine, it's always section nine, which talks about the declared performance. Um, and in the operational reliability and application category section, it goes into uh, detail about you know, what is covered. Um, it's basically being very specific about you know its frequency converter um, uh, driven up to and including a, a 280 frame uh, driven within a converter with uh, a voltage waveform filter 280 frame and above that type of detail you'll also see it makes specific reference in this example to resistance to fire category which is f400 420 minutes so 400 degrees C for two hours, um, you know, and says something about um, the insulation class of the motor, class H in this case. Um, and then there's an additional part to this document, which is the annex or appendix, um, which um, goes into a bit more detail about the range of products that we've got. So in this case, it will say um, confirm that you know yes, indeed, it is um, possible to get a F200, F300, or F400, um, or in fact an F600 uh, rated fan, not necessarily uh, in inverter controlled, but you know, those are all variants that we can provide. And then it goes into detail about who the motor manufacturer is because obviously that's intrinsic to the uh, the solution so 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 that's you know important to note but we'll also you know confirm what fan accessories are included and you'll notice in there down towards the bottom uh, four up from the bottom it, it talks about a frequency converter or inverter drive being an accessory so Again, you know, we're reinforcing the fact that we've got coverage of all of these uh, variants within our range. Um, so that really sort of just ties up um, the certification piece. Um, as far as what I wanted to say today is concerned, that that uh, pretty much gets to to the end of what I wanted to say. Um, but what I have to say is that this this presentation, which you know obviously we can make available to you, has got um, additional appendix slides, which I, I don't propose to go through. But there are other bits of advice that go into a bit more detail for things like you know, fire mode, etc. So the only other thing to say really at this point is to Thank you very much for staying with me and uh, attending today. Um, and other than that, to say that if you do need some extra assistance, you want to know more, then reach out to us. Uh, we're here to support you.